Uh, suddenly we have this enormous supply of weapons, perhaps a million tons, which is almost as many as exist in the United States, completely open for the picking. Completely open. Now, uh, Christopher is making a lot of arguments about, in fact, imminent threat. In fact, many of his arguments uh, essentially rely on the perception that Saddam and Al-Qaeda were essentially the same. They're not. They're not. They weren't the same. And the arguments made for supporting the war were misleading, ob obfuscatory, if you put it that way, um, and relied on premises that have since been disproven. Saddam attacks, attacks his neighbors twice. Well, the Iranian war, uh, America supported Saddam in attacking his neighbor. Ten years later, can we use that as a reason to attack him? Saddam gassed his citizens. He did, indeed, and the United States supported him during that time. <coughs> does that mean Saddam is not a threat? Not necessarily. It does mean that when you hear people making these arguments, you should reach for your wallet and make sure it's still in your pocket. You know, we're having an argument tonight or a discussion that seems to have to do with national security. But it only marginally has to do with national security. What it has to do with is national integrity. Whether we as a democracy can make decisions based on facts, based on how the world actually is, whether we can make judgments about our security, what makes us safer and what makes us less safe, and can do it in a competent, judicious way without our leaders misleading us. It seems to me from this stage we're seeing another example of such misleading. Before I left my house tonight, I looked at the current state of the New York Times and saw something that had just been posted. Blasts shake U.S. headquarters in Baghdad, injuring four. Three powerful explosions shook central Baghdad this evening in an apparent mortar attack on the headquarters of the American civil civilian authorities here. The explosions in rapid succession hit what appeared to be the sprawling American compound at about 7.45 local time. Uh, spokesman said four people had been injured but otherwise gave no details. Iraqi witnesses said they, said they saw mortar fire from the Baghdad neighborhood attacking American headquarters. They're getting desperate. They're getting more and more desperate. They're now attacking American headquarters in Baghdad. The question is, is the threat from Iraq now less than it was when this war was begun by the Bush administration? Are Americans more or less in danger now than they were then? Christopher would tell you that uh, things were about to fall apart. Saddam was getting stronger. Saddam was getting weaker. Iraq was getting stronger. Iraq was about to fall apart. One way or another, America had to invade. I ask you to look at the facts. Look at your newspapers every day. You want to talk about Al-Qaeda, the terrorist threat? They're now in Iraq. They were claimed to be beforehand. They're there now. You just have to watch the network news every night and see how desperate they're becoming. Seven minutes uh, for Hitchens. Well, I decided to become a journalist in part because I didn't want to have to rely on the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still very sorry for people for, the, for whom that is their source of news. <clears throat> I, think I'll, I think I can decently maintain that the uh, George Bush School of Paradox, as updated by Mark to try and catch me in saying that the Saddam the same regime was A, getting much worse, and B, getting more unstable, is not in fact a contradiction. Both things could be true, and both things would have been true, and the eventual implosion of the society and the state would have been the more gruesome and bloody as a result, and if it was unsupervised by the international community, even more bloody still. Um, the obfuscation perpetrated by the Bush regime to convince 68% of the population that Saddam Hussein was behind the 9-11 attacks must have been as clever as Mark says it was since the administration never in fact made that claim. 
and has never made it and has repeatedly repudiated it. That's my uh, this point is, exactly. This is, this is quite a scale of obfuscation. It might argue for a certain amount of credulity on the part of the uh, American public, but that, as I say, could also be to do with the newspapers that they are or are not reading. Um, that there is a connection between Saddamism and Jihadism, I think, need not be doubted. Uh, cannot, in fact, be doubted. It, it was openly uh, promoted and promulgated by the Iraqi regime. I stress again, the Ansar al-Islam group had directly been led this group, sponsored by them in Kurdistan, the support for the suicide uh, murderers in Palestine, the support for jihad as a, as a rhetoric, and perhaps not negligible entirely, the consistent support by Osama bin Laden um, of the Ba'ath Party's rule in Iraq and his definition of it as the front line in the struggle against American imperialism, which allowance made for rhetorical excess, he was correct in saying, yes, it is going to be a front line state in this war. I'm not in favor of crying before we have been seriously hurt. The 87 billion hasn't kicked in yet. The United States has absolute military superiority in Iraq. To listen to Mark Downey, you would think we were on the verge of a military defeat in a war that quite simply cannot be lost for the sake not just of the Iraqis, but of ourselves. The war's barely begun. I'm not in favor of the raising of any white flag at this point. Now, I may say, I may add on the matter of obfuscation and misapprehension about responsibility here, that though the Bush regime uh, did not say, has never said that Saddam Hussein was directly behind 9-11, uh, the flagship magazine of the peace movement, my former employers of the nation, are the publishers of a very widely sold and distributed book by Gore Vidal, which says that George Bush was the man behind 9-11. Now, fortunately, 68% of the American people are not so bloody stupid as to believe that. But perhaps 70% of the peace movement, judging by the meetings I've attended and discussions I've heard and emails I get, are fully up for considering that as the root cause of our ills. Let's be clear what we're talking about. Uh, let's not be flippant about matters of security. There was and there is a Hitler-Stalin pact between the forces of jihad and the force of Ba'athist totalitarianism. It's an honor to be on the other side from it. It's an honor to have as many Iraqi and Kurdish friends as I can claim who've already decided to risk their lives to do it and for a long time are risking their lives alone and I maintain risking them for our sakes as well. Um, since we're talking about uh, our safety, our security, if we just decide to limit ourselves to that, I'd like to, I'd like to put a, a proposition to you uh, for your consideration. There's a, there's a tendency in this discussion so far, one that I very much reprobate, and one that I find a good deal in the New York Times, to, to name only one newspaper, and also in the Democratic Party, to watch this outcome as if to see, I wonder how it's going to work out. <clears throat> I wonder if Bush is going to win, or General Abizade is going to win. I wonder if the, if the Fedahin Saddam and their allies in Al-Qaeda are going to win. Some days it looks bad for one side, some days not so bad. Who is daring to look at this as if they were spectators? Who is then worrying about and claiming that they feel more or less secure in their own persons and homes? Who is watching this as a neutral is what I want to inquire. This uh, society uh, produces and maintains an enormous number of charitable, voluntary and non-governmental organizations. Mark and I in our various excursions to the Balkans, for example, or in his case particularly to Haiti, have seen many cases. Kosovo is an outstanding one, um, where groups of this kind have made an extraordinary difference. Not just American ones, of course, but European ones too. I find it deplorable in the extreme that from the United Nations itself, which is part of the headquarters group of many of these NGOs, all the way down to the American community level, that there are not people saying, what can we do to help the people of Iraq and Kurdistan? Are we watching as spectators? We, how dare we do this? Why are there not people helping the women's groups of, of Iraq to recover and defend their liberties? Why are there no volunteers in, in Kurdistan? to help uh, uncover the mass graves, to help dig wells, uh, to help uh, repair the roads. Why are there not people? Uh, the place where I'm standing is uh, so full of uh, green people that you uh, can hardly bear it sometimes. Um, <laughs> the largest wetlands in the Middle East are put to the torch by Saddam Hussein, first drained and then burned. It's the greatest ecological disaster ever registered by the United Nations. The smoke from it could be seen from the space shuttle. You had to watch it then because Saddam Hussein was in charge of it all, as he was of all those weapons that are now lying around but no longer under his control. Now you don't have to watch. You can do something about it. Or you could, or you could have waited for him to do what he did when he was leaving.